Well, hello, my name's Adrian Gilbert, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Invisible College. Quite possibly this is going to be your first time because uh, this is a new series that I'm doing. Uh, I'm setting up the college now in a more formal way than it has been. I've been putting videos up uh, on YouTube uh, for all and sundry to look at if they wish. Uh, in particular, I've been doing a lot on the book of Revelation. Um, but that's my work. I mean, that's that's my service, if you like, uh, for the world, for the planet, for anyone who's wanting to know more about that particular book. But this is going to be something more specific for those who have shown a definite interest in this work and wish to make use of the knowledge and techniques which I've learned over 50 years uh, for how to carry on successful self-transformation and I'm going to talk to you, you know, there's going to be a lot of lectures on this and different subjects but today I'm going to talk to you about our predicament because if you don't understand where you are now then you've got no reason to think that maybe you should be trying to do something different and I'm going to go into that with a, it'll be, I think it'll be a fairly short lecture um, just to explain our predicament, which is a very serious one, I have to tell you. And I'm not talking about, you know, climate change, global warming, all that kind of thing. Nothing to do with that. This is actually about the human condition and the situation that we find ourselves in today here on planet Earth. So without more ado, let's press on. Now, a major figure who's been an inspiration for me is this gentleman, Robert Flood. Uh, he lived between 1574 and 1637, so his, his lifespan uh, covered uh, part of the uh, rule of Queen Elizabeth I, uh, going through James I, who died, I believe, in 1625, and then on to the reign of Charles I, uh, before the uh, Civil War. So he, he lived at a very interesting time in English history, the time of the uh, beginnings, well, the end of the Renaissance and the beginnings of what's sometimes called the Enlightenment. And he was a, an English esoteric philosopher and a Paracelsian physician, which means he dealt in herbs and various kinds of treatments. But he was also an astrologer and he was also into studying all manner of different uh, subject areas, whatever caught his interest, really. Um, but he was undoubtedly, in my opinion, an enlightened man and um, some kind of initiate. And he claimed himself to be uh, a Rosicrucian and I've no wish to dispute that. Um, so maybe that's where his... Uh, initiation came from <coughs> from that source which again is a very interesting um, uh, society which started during his lifetime um, with the publications of some pamphlets in 1614 but we won't go into that because that's not what's important here um, but he wrote a number of books very big heavy books written in Latin and heavily illustrated and I'm not going to go into the Latin. My Latin is not up to being able to read the original text. I'm, I can do some Latin, but not to that level. Um, but his, his uh, illustrations are very uh, interesting in their own right and tell us a great deal about his philosophy. So here is the first one, which tells us about the descent of souls uh, through the higher and lower heavens to eventually incarnate on earth. Now you can see here at the top of this diagram you've got this sort of big uh, explosion almost like the sun um, and written inside there is Deus which means God so the idea that God is there is emanating energy emanating uh, creativity and the universe is shown here as a series of rings, concentric rings, um, which come out of his creation. And the first ring, the first level, actually, you can't really read it too carefully, you know, clearly here, but it says men's, 
which means mind. So the first thing that God creates is mind, at least in, in the opinion of Robert, Fl Robert Flood. And then from the mind of God are created, first of all, angelic spheres. And you can see here the seraphim, the cherubim, the dom dominations, the thrones, the potentates, the principa principatus, uh, the virtues, and then we get the archangels and angels. So the archangels and angels are actually the two lowest of the angelic spheres. Then it might surprise you, because we always tend to think of the archangels as being these supreme beings, you know, like Michael and Gabriel and so on. But they're actually uh, sort of more like the generals of the angelic uh, kingdom who are the closest to us in terms of rank and therefore most accessible to us and you probably heard it said that every person has a guardian angel assigned to them at birth and i think that's true but i would go further than that and say that uh, it's possible for you to have more than one um, in fact you can have a whole bunch of them if you are involved in some kind of definite work that uh, requires help and assistance from that level so these are the first levels that we see listed here and the souls we're shown the souls coming out of god you can see coming out of like that um from deus coming down there you can see that first little soul coming out being popped out like an egg really and then they, they travel down through the spheres one after another you can see them coming down spiraling their way down these little winged souls and they come down through the different spheres and then end up on the earth. And to do that, they come through, um, first of all, below the angelic sphere is Chalum Stellatum, which means stars of heaven. And that is equivalent to what we would call the fixed stars in the sky, or the celestial sphere of stars, which rotates around us, as you know, or it seems to, because the earth is actually doing the rotating. But it seems to us that the heavens rotate around us once every every day. Um, and that's got all the constellations stuck on it. Um, you can imagine a, a sphere with all these stars stuck on the inside of it uh, in their relative positions. Things like the, the Leo and Gemini and, and Capricorn. And then, of course, you've got other uh, uh, ones which are not zodiacal signs you've got uh, things like Auriga and Orion and and uh, uh, Perseus and so all manner of other constellations those those are the fixed stars and this all makes up that that's the boundary between the lower and the higher heavens the higher heavens are really the angelic spheres beyond that but below the fixed stars we then come into the lower heavens which are the planetary spheres. And you've probably heard that uh, in the old days, they used to believe that, that there were a series of glass spheres around the Earth, and the planets were stuck on the inside of these, and these spheres rotated, and, and the planets moved with them. And so they could work out the cycles of the planets. They're called planets because they move, um, uh, as opposed to the fixed stars, which apparently don't move except in the general rotation they don't move with respect to one another or well, not perceptibly so so the outermost of their spheres planetary spheres is that of saturn now of course they didn't know about uranus and neptune in those days um, they weren't discovered until well after his time um, and so the, there were seven spheres of the ancients and including the sun and moon um, which were also obviously moving bodies uh, and there were five other planets as far as they were concerned which were Saturn, Jupiter, Mars and then coming within you've got the Sun and then you've got within that you've got Venus and you've got Mercury and of course the Moon. So you had seven altogether and these spheres the souls descend through and they come down here, you can see here, they come down Venus, Mercurius, Luna, which is Moon. And that's the last of those spheres. And then it comes, the soul comes down through the fiery sphere. Now, isn't that interesting? Because uh, those of you who know something about me, I've been quite involved in something called the Electric Universe. 
um, which is a new kind of science of the universe, looking at how the universe is actually driven by electricity. Uh, it's not just all gravity and, and big bangs and things crashing into each other and empty space. There's a lot of what's called plasma. In fact, 99% of what makes up the visible or the perceptual universe is in the plasma state, which, to put it briefly, is either free electrons or it can be charged up um, uh, nuclei of elements or hydrogen nuclei, which are positively charged. Electrons are negative. And these together form plasma, and it has a very different behavior from wind or air. Uh, it, they, they form what are called double layers. I won't go into that, but they, the whole behavior of this um, is completely different from air. And actually, we, we see plasmas at work here on Earth as well. Every time you light a fire, the, the flames, the fire, contains plasma. There are elements there in the plasma um, uh, uh, state, which is the fire state. So they're not wrong here when they talk about fire as being a state of matter. It is. It's the fourth state. And then below that, you get the state of Aries or air. And then you get aqua, water. And finally, you get terra or earth. So this is how Flood was seeing the universe um, and how the souls come from God and they progress down, 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 going down, in, almost like going into what's called a gravity well, I suppose, um, ending up on the earth in the middle. <coughs> now, this was only one of his diagrams. He had others too, which are very important. And here's another one, which we're going to go into in some detail. And this one's called... Uh, Integre Naturae Speculum Artisque uh, Imago, which means mirror of the whole of nature and the image of art. And if I go into this in, in some detail, um, it's a very important diagram that further explains Flood's philosophy of descending cosmoses in a more detailed fashion. Um, but I want us to go to, first of all, this one. Here we are, between Flood's drawing. And you see here at the top, the figure here, the, there's a, it's like a cloud and, with radiation coming out of it. And you can see here this writing in the middle. That's actually Hebrew. And it, it's read from the right to the left, not left to right like we do in English, but right to left. And it says yod hey vau hey um, which is the tetragrammaton, or the, the unmentionable name of God. Um, yod heh vau -Hey is sometimes written as Jehovah or Yahweh, um, uh, but it's, it supposedly would, would never be actually said um, by the, uh, the Israelites or the Jews um, when reading the Bible or whatever, and they would just say the tetragrammaton, the four, the four words, or the four letters. So we see here God is at the top of the creation, and he's outside of it, just as he was in the other picture just now. And then if we progress, we see here his cloud stands outside of the creation, and we have these spheres of the angels. And these exist as a series of concentric spheres, and nearest to God himself are three spheres or choirs of angels. Like God himself, these are supernatural or above nature. And that will become more clear as we progress with this little talk. And the outermost sphere, closest to God, are the highest, most powerful angels. The cherubim, the seraphim and the thrones. And we do actually meet these in the Bible. I think in the book of Revelation, obviously... Um, but I think also with Ezekiel, you get to see the um, the thrones with the four beasts and the turning wheels. Um, the seraphim are the kind of fire angels. I think a, a seraph is put outside to stop man coming back after he's been cast out of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis, a seraph, a seraph is set there, the, the flaming sword, to stop 
you know, him invading back in to the Garden of Eden. And that's a whole other subject, isn't it? Um, and the cherubim, well, we meet the cherubim, uh, at least images of them, with the Ark of the Covenant. And they, there, there are big cherubim uh, angels placed there as protective guardians of the Ark. And on top of the Ark, there are two made of gold. Now, of course, these are symbols. You can imagine that there's, there are actually divine powers guarding the Ark as well. Uh, so you better not touch it. Um, if you find it by chance, don't touch it. Uh, you might find that they're, they're still guarding it and you could get struck dead immediately. Um, this is... We're not dealing with flying saucers here. We're dealing with entities, very, very powerful entities. Uh, at least from, from the point of view of this teaching and from the point of view of what I would like to teach you. And then we come to the second sphere. The angels are called dominations, virtues and powers. So these are kind of uh, metaphysical, uh, angelic beings which are, have direct control over whole areas of existence. Exactly what they're, they're, these areas are is something to be discussed at a later date, but they're well above our level, let's put it that way. And the third sphere, or inner ring, is the closest to mankind and comprises the principalities, the archangels, and the angels. Now, as I said, you know, the ones that we're going to, if we come across angels at all, it's probably going to be the lowest level, the angels. Um, we meet with the archangel Michael and the archangel Gabriel in the Bible, um, fighting the war in heaven against Satan and the fallen angel and his, his, uh, his fellow fallen angels. And that again is another very big subject. Um, but we don't need to discuss that at this point. I just want you to see here that we have the three spheres here of the angelic uh, uh, higher heavens. And these angelic spheres, um, there's, there's nine orders of angels, nine choirs of angels. And that doesn't just mean that they sing. <laughs> a choir can also mean a circle. So there's nine of these um, these levels of angels um, through which creation is administered. Now, in Robert Flood's drawing, he, he shows you the starry and planetary spheres. Now, between these red lines that I've drawn, you can see the planetary spheres here um, are laid out. And, and the stars, you see that ring of stars just inside the, the larger red circle. That's the uh, celestial sphere, as I was saying about the, the fixed constellations. We can imagine being stuck on inside of that. And then we have the planetary spheres that the soul progresses through as it comes down um, in, you know, through the, the seven planets of the ancients. So same thing as he was teaching in the earlier um, diagram. And we can see in more detail here the, the labelling of the planetary spheres at the bottom here. You can see uh, Chalum Celeste Stellatum, which means these, the, the stars of heaven. And then you've got Saturn, Saturnus. You've got Jovis, that's Jove or Jupiter. And then you've got Martis or Mars. Solace, the sun. The sun is seen as being in, in, in a sphere going round the earth. This is uh, pre-Copernican. But in a way, it's, it is actually correct, because from our point of view, the earth is at the centre <laughs> of everything. You know, yes, of course, we know that from the point of view of the solar system, the sun is at the centre. But the sun is not at the centre of the universe either. It's not even at the centre of the Milky Way. So... It's all a, a, a question of relativity and where you're standing. So from a mystical, um, metaphysical standpoint, it's not actually wrong to say the Earth is at the centre, because that's where it is from, from where we are. That's where we're standing. Um, so that's where we would draw our map, as it were. So where you would see in a solely-centric uh, 
picture of the solar system, you would have the sun in the centre and then you'd have the Earth as the fourth planet out. Uh, sorry, third planet out. You'd have Mercury, Venus and the Earth. And of course they put the lunar, the fourth one, the moon, because the moon is closer to the Earth. But the where they put Solis, sun, the sun, um, then that's where Earth would normally be if you were looking from the point of view of solar system from a sun point of view. I think I've made that clear. <laughs> uh, and then you've got underneath that, you've got animalia, vegetabilia, mineralia. That's the, the three animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom and the mineral kingdom. And then you've got um, uh, artes liberationes, the liberal arts as a, as a cycle. Well, that, that is, the liberal arts was kind of what you studied if you were going to university and being educated. There were seven subjects you had to study, uh, known as the liberal arts. They included things like geometry, uh, music, uh, poetry. Uh, I forget what the other ones are now, but astronomy would be one of them. But you, there were seven subjects that if you wanted to be a learned person, you had to study. And that, those were the liberal arts. So there's a kind of sense of education fitting in here. Um, so we've got there, uh, and underneath the moon, there's the elemental spheres. Um, I've left them out, haven't I? Yes. Well, uh, we talk, discussed that before, the, the fire and the air and the water and the earth. And beneath these are three kingdoms of nature, animalia, animals, vegetabilia, vegetables, and mineralia, minerals. And within these are spheres for the liberal arts and also spheres for how art, and now when, when they use the word art, they're really meaning human ingenuity. Uh, a lot of what we would call technology is, is actually called art in those days. And so there's the art that can uh, corrects the mineralia. That's what it says here in, in some of that writing, which is quite small and hard to read. And it assists the vegetable and supplements the animal kingdom. So this is kind of saying how our art, our ability, our technology um, can do things and it can correct the mineral kingdom. Why, by correct, I think he probably means um, extracting metals from minerals, for example, um, cutting certain diamonds and things to make, show them at their best, their best way um, as jewels as opposed to just naked stone. So it can assist the mineral kingdom. And it can uh, assist the vegetables. Well, you know, we, we plant things, we grow things, we farm them. We don't just leave them to grow wild, you know. <laughs> we don't expect to go with, be hunters and gatherers when there's seven billion of us on the planet. We have to be more, um, you know, specific about how we get our food. We have to farm things and grow things. And then it says, we supplement the animal kingdoms. So I guess that's to do with breeding cattle and sheep and so on as well. Um, and, and getting the animal kingdom to, to work with us, dogs to work with us, for example, rounding up sheep or horses to ride on, um, plowing, that kind of thing. So it's man's artistry that has kind of in a way tamed nature. This is kind of what it's saying here. It's supplementing, it's, it's making nature work in a way which is more positive and beneficial for us. Um, so th that's kind of how he's seeing these, these spheres. Now, when we look more closely, we see in the middle here, you can see, I, I'll put a small version of it there. We can see we have this, this ball which is like the Earth. It looks like there's continents there and there's oceans. And sitting on it is this ape-like figure. And he represents mankind. He represents man. And man is not looking around him. He's focused on looking at this globe. And he's got a pair of dividers, this ape. And behind him, you can see a, the magic square. Uh, it's actually, that is the magic square of Saturn, I think. Um, uh, and so it, it, numbers come into this, numerology. He's using 
things like numerology and geometry to try to understand the world that he's in. In other words, this is he, the, the simian ape. He represents man, the scientist, that we look at things, we try to study the laws of nature to understand them and um, that in that way somehow control our environment, control our world. And this is a very tempting thing. This is actually the most tempting thing. If you read, you know, in the book of Genesis, it talks about Adam and Eve in the garden and the devil there, you know, it's the serpent who gives them the fruit to eat. Um, says to them, you know, you can become like God, you know. You just need to know that, you know, what I'm going to teach you, you need to know the difference between good and evil and study and your science and you'll, you'll be as smart as he is, you know. Well, of course, this is fatal. Well, it has been fatal for us. And we'll discuss this further in other lectures. But if you think about it, um, we find ourselves in this extraordinary universe. We don't know where it came from. We have scientists who pontificate and say, yes, we know at the middle of the Milky Way there's a black hole because our mathematics that we've worked out on a computer simulation tells us there must be a very strong attracting force there and yeah, it must be a black hole because it's, we can't see it, uh, but we must be there. And they invent all sorts of concepts and things. We, We've no, we've no idea what's at the centre of the Milky Way, but we have this attitude that we should we should present ourselves as all knowing. And had you been alive at the time, you know, when Flood was writing his books and drawing his diagrams, if you felt a bit feverish and you went to the doctor, the chances are he's going to cut a whole you know a vein and bleed you. You know, oh, we've got too much blood, too much sanguine. Just let some blood out, and then you'll feel better. <laughs> well, we don't do that now, do we? Um, we've got other types of medicine. Uh, you go to the doctor now and say, well, take this poisonous tablet, and you'll feel much better. <laughs> Only a little bit of poison, just enough to uh, deal with those symptoms that are troubling you. Uh, is that the right way? Shouldn't we be understanding what's out of balance in our body? Um, well, I'll leave it to you to think, but we have this attitude that always the science that we have today, we've got it. So we have this attitude that um, all we need to do is cross a few T's and dot a few I's and we'll know everything, you know. We're, our science, we got it, you know. We're as smart as God. It's a big temptation. And of course we aren't. We don't know if the first thing about this creation. We're like sorcerer's apprentices, you know, and we get we start casting spells and we don't know how to switch them off. It's like in that Mickey Mouse cartoon. Anyway, so here we see man shown as an ape sitting on the on the planet and he's studying a globe and he thinks that he's really smart and clever and he's got it sussed, but he doesn't understand his own situation. And the apes clearly represents man who, oblivious of their wonderment of the higher spheres of stars and angels, is immersed in his own miniaturized thoughts that we were today call science. In Flood's time, science was called natural philosophy. So this, this ape of nature, he's a natural philosopher. <laughs> now, interestingly, in case you think that Flood's the only one thinking along these lines, here's another scholar who's a little bit younger than him, uh, sort of generation later, uh, called Athanasius Kircher. And he was another great scholar, and he was um, a Jesuit priest. And he wrote loads of books as well and studied all sorts of things. Another Renaissance man. Um, and here's a diagram of his from one of his books. And you can see here again, instead of putting the angels in three concentric spheres, he's put a, an enneagram, nine... Uh, pointed star and he's put a different uh, choir of angels so still nine of them arranged around in a circuit around the trinity is a triangle with the eye of god in the middle of it so this is kind of a more catholic view you might say whereas flood was a protestant 
Um, but they, they, you know, basically they agree on this. And below that, you see here again this flying collection of circles uh, with wings on. I mean, that the universe is in flight; it's moving, and the stars of the fixed stars are arranged around the outside there you can see around the outside of that circle and i don't know if you can see it it's not that clear but you can see the planetary spheres labeled there coming down to the earth now what's also interesting in this picture is you can imagine that this is all the sort of you've got the high the, the heavens that you can see which are the planets and the stars and above them the higher heavens which are supernatural. You can't see them. You can't see the angels. You can't see God. It's all, that's all supernatural. Um, and at the bottom, you've got the earth, and you've got these two figures here sitting on the earth. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see this, this guy. He's got here a symbol representing Pythagoras' theorem. Remember that? The square on the hypotenuse is equal to the square on the other two sides of a right angled triangle. Well, you've got a 3, 4, 5 triangle. And if you imagine 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. Add those together, it comes to 25, which is the same as 5 squared. So that is clearly Pythagoras, who was a great scholar who went to Egypt and he was taught there by the Egyptians. He would have learnt Pythagoras' theorem from the Egyptians. <laughs> uh, they knew a lot about geometry. Just go and look at the pyramids. Um, we'll be talking about the pyramids in later lectures. But he knew a lot about geometry, which he had learnt from the Egyptians. And on the other side, you've got this other figure here, a turbaned Eastern philosopher, and I think that's almost certainly meant to represent Hermes Trismegistus, um, who is renowned as uh, the teacher. Uh, in Hebrew, his Hebrew name would have been Enoch. And the word Enoch means teacher. And Enoch was the great grandfather of Noah. So he's a pre-diluvian. That means from before the flood. And... The Egyptians would have called him, knew him as Thoth or Tot. And Tot was credited, and still is actually, if you go to Egypt, under his name Hermes. Hermes Trismegistus is what the Greeks called Tot. Um, he's credited with having built the Great Pyramid and the other pyramids of Giza, which are quite different from the later pyramids you see, which are just rubble heaps. Um, and this is kind of saying, well, actually, those pyramids were built before the flood. And his teachings and his knowledge is pre-diluvian. Um, now, we'll, we'll be going into the uh, Hermetica uh, quite a bit in later lectures. Uh, but I, I just wanted to introduce you here, first of all, to Hermes Trismegistus and what he had to say. And I'm going to read out to you a little extract from the Hermetica, which talks about the creation. Now, the Hermetica is a collection of um, documents. This is, this is a, an edition I published myself. I don't know if you can see it uh, that way. Um, I published this in 1992. It's out of print now, unfortunately. Um, but it's a classic work that had disappeared in the West until 1453, when a copy was brought to the court of Cosimo de' Medici in Florence from Constantinople, which had just fallen to the Turks. And one of the escaping Greeks had the foresight to bring out this amazing book, which people in the West hadn't seen for centuries. And Cosimo immediately had it translated, and it was a very big influence on the Renaissance because, of course, Florence was the kind of birthplace, in many respects, of the Renaissance. All the people like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and many others. Um, Marsilio Ficino, who translated it for, for Cosimo. Um, so, well, the actual documents contained in this are not as old. <laughs> We're not real pre-diluvian documents here. 
they probably date from around the time of Jesus, maybe just after. But nevertheless, they contain the Egyptian philosophy as it had been handed down within the schools of the Egyptians, because so much of what was taught in esoteric schools, we have no idea because it wasn't written down. It was all passed on master to student, master to student. We weren't allowed to write it down. Um, but we have got some documents here and they do give us good insight into what the ancient Egyptians believed going way back um, in, in time. So I'm going to read you out uh, an extract here about the creation and it will explain a lot to you. And nature, even as mind the maker willed, brought forth from the downward tending elements, that's, that's the downward tending elements is water and earth, animals devoid of reason, for she no longer had with her the word. In other words, the Logos wasn't working with nature, but we'll, we'll come to that in another time. The air brought forth birds, and the water fishes, Earth and water had by this time been separated from one another, and the earth brought forth four-footed creatures and creeping things, beasts wild and tame. Right. So this is a bit like Book of Genesis, saying that, that those things were created by the earth. But mind, right? I told you, mind is the men's, is the very first creation of God in the flood diagram. But mind, the father of all, he who is life and light, in other words, that's what we're told is the Logos, is the life and the light. In the beginning of St. John's Gospel, we get that. Um, gave birth to man, a being like to himself. And he took delight in man as being his own offspring. For man was very goodly to look on, bearing the likeness of his father. In other words, man is made in the image of God. Right, is in the likeness of God. Just as you, your children are in your likeness, you, know, you, you can see, oh yeah, he's got his mother's eyes and his father's feet and, you know, a bit of your grandfather there. Um, in the likeness, there's a family thing that carries on. Uh, it's saying the same about man, that something about God has carried on with us in his, in his, in his likeness. With good reason, then, did God take delight in man, for it was God's own form that God took delight in. And God delivered over to man all things that he ha that had been made. All right, so that's just like Genesis again. And man took station in the maker's sphere. All right, so he's taking station. He's right up there with God, standing up there in the maker's sphere, and observed the things made by his brother, who were set over the region of fire. And having observed the Maker's creation in the region of fire, he willed to make things for his own part also, and his father gave permission, having in himself all the workings of the administrators. The administrators are the planets and those who administer the spheres. And the administrators took delight in him, and each of them gave him a share of his own nature, right? So the administrators, he's come down through the spheres. I think by sphere, sphere of fire, I think it's referring to the, the, uh, the celestial sphere of the stars that in, in this particular instance. And having learnt to know the being of the administrators and received a share of their nature, he willed to break through the bounding circle of their orbit and he looked down through the structure of the heavens, having broken through the sphere, and showed to downward tending nature the beautiful form of God. Right, so he's come down through the spheres of the planets, and he's looked down, he's, he's broken through that sphere of fire. I suppose that's the sphere of fire, because it's the first one, isn't it, after, after Luna. Um, but he's shown himself to nature. And nature, that's Mother Earth, or, or Mother Nature, seeing the beauty of the form of God, smiled with insatiate love of man, showing the reflection of that most beautiful form in the water and its shadow on the earth. And he, seeing this form, a form like to his own, in earth and water, loved it 
and will to dwell there. <clears throat> and the deed and the deed followed close on the design, and he took up his abode in matter, devoid of reason. Right? So the matter was devoid of reason, just like animals, they don't have our intelligence. You know, they they don't go out and build houses. Well, I suppose birds make nests, but they don't create new things all the time. They're not inventive like we are. And will to dwell there. And he, uh, and he took up his abode in matter, devoid of reason. And nature, when she had got him with, with whom she was in love, wrapped him in her clasp, and they were mingled in one, for they were in love with one another. And that is why man, unlike all the other living creatures upon earth, is twofold. He is mortal by reason of his body. He is immortal by reason of the man of eternal substance. He is immortal and has all things in his power. Yet he suffers the lot of a mortal, being subject to destiny. He is exalted above the structure of the heavens. Yet he was born a slave of destiny. He is bisexual as his father is bisexual and sleepless as his father is sleepless, yet he is mastered by carnal desire and by oblivion. So that's the hermetic version of the creation, uh, similar but different from what you get in Genesis. And that's a good reason in itself, I think, for studying ancient Egypt, but I'll be talking a lot more about that in later lectures. So that's Hermes Trismegistus. And here we can see a, an image of Hermes Trismegistus. And you'll find him in many alchemical textbooks. And you'll very often see him robed like this, like an Eastern philosopher or prince. And he nearly always is shown holding that curious, uh, what's called an armillary sphere. It's a, it's a kind of hollowed out sphere that shows the, uh, the, the structure of, this, of this, the cosmos. Um, with different belts around it, but you know, again, we'll probably explain that at some other time. So, uh, I want to take us now back to the image we had before of Mother Nature, and you can see here how she has us in chains. Um, if we can go to this image, you see that Mother Nature is herself also held by a chain from the hand of God. Now that's very interesting. Um, she's got us in chains, but she's not free to do whatever she wants. She is also under control, obviously, from God. And that's because nature receives energy, obviously, it receives energy from the sun. And the sun itself receives energy from the Milky Way. And it's something else we'll explain much more in detail, uh, the electric universe uh, uh, concept in later lectures but she's she can't just do exactly what she wants but she has got a lot of control she she doesn't want to lose human souls um she doesn't want to surrender them back up to where we came from so we have to find a way to break free because she's acting as a go-between a wholesaler in other words we get our energy from her from the air from the you know from the food we eat and so on and we look upon that as our, you know, life. That's where life comes from. But actually life itself is an energy. And it's the energy of creation of the universe. It comes from God, ultimately. Um, and we need to find a way to reconnect back to the source beyond nature. Supernature, you could call it. We need to get, uh, you know, take the chain that she's got off on us get rid of that and link back to God. And that's what the whole purpose is of the, the of Christianity, but of all real religions, is to restore the situation where we are souls who are in con connection with God. I mean, the word religion, religio, ligio is, is, is the root that, from which we get ligature, tying something together. And uh, ligo, I tie. Um, so, religio is retying, relinking, rejoining to God. And we have within us 
the potential to do that. And this is what all real religion is about. It's about learning how to open up higher centers in ourselves that can receive energy directly instead of just the food we eat and, and everything that we get from nature, we can be electrically connected to the Godhead. And of course, this is what Jesus Christ was. And this is what the descent of the Holy Spirit is all about. So you will understand this more as we go further in, into these lectures. But this is what we have to break free from nature, wonderful as she is, uh, our mother nature. Um, we don't belong here on this earth. That's why we all, we feel like we're um, we're in exile because we are. Um, we don't believe belong down here in the animal kingdom. We belong much higher up in in the universe, and we need to get back there. So, I'm going to show you this, this other slide here, and here we see the wise man finds the way to link the toad to the eagle. You can then carry him to the higher heavens and thereby escape from the embrace of nature. So this is another alchemical drawing. The, the wise man is, of course, Hermes Trismegistus, I would think. But you can think of him as the archetypal uh, alchemist. You know, he's got a big book under his arm there. <laughs> he's a, a wise man. And ultimately, it's the work of the invisible college it will take a while. Uh, this ultimately is the work of the Invisible College, but it will take a while and a lot of other steps before most people are ready for this level of initiation. And this is what it is. This is initiation, and it's. I, I'll explain it in detail. This is much further down the line, but this is what we're working towards. The frog, or the toad, represents our lower nature, and the eagle is that transcendent energy, the force of the logos that can carry the toad back up, rescue us from the baseness that we find ourselves in on this planet Earth. You might not think that we're living in a place of baseness when you compare it with other planets like Mars and, and so on. You see, well, there's no life there. There's life here. Yes, but there are higher things than life. There are higher things than this uh, transformative place that we find ourselves in where it's all eat and be eaten. We need to connect back to where the energy is coming to us directly. Um, we can become stars. So that, my friends, is the, the predicament we find ourselves in, that we're here in bondage to nature. And this is why great avatars, Jesus Christ, obviously, but there have been others before him coming here to rescue mankind and we need to be ready because the time is nigh <laughs> i should have a placard and walk down oxford street the time is nigh um well you read your book of revelation you read your book of daniel you read the other prophecies in the bible and you look around you at what's happening in the world today yeah it's the time is nigh if it's not going to happen shortly when is it you know so um I'll leave that with you and thank you for listening to my words and the first lecture in this series and uh, let's go forwards from here and I'll be giving you more details on the uh, what's going to happen further with the Invisible College. Uh, this is only the uh, introductory level as it were um, but more about that later. Thank you. Right.